Good morning, church. As we continue in our study of the book of Romans, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we'll be looking at the first eight verses of Romans 4. And if you have found your way there, would you join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes, What shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness, apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be gathered here in your presence on this first day of the week, the day that Christ conquered sin and death and Satan. And as we turn to this very important text, Father, I pray truly that you would be with the one who preaches, his sins are many, fill him full of your spirit, hide him as a, as a man, may he not get in the way of the doctrine that is being presented to us. We pray also that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, hearts to believe. We pray, Father, that this morning we would not just be challenged, but changed, not just confronted, but conformed to the image of him with whom we have to do, even Jesus. And we pray this in Christ's name and all God's people again said, amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the most influential philosophers in the world is the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor. And of Taylor's many contributions is what he called social imaginaries. A social imaginary is a web of ideas and beliefs and practices, values, orientations, attitudes, assumptions, impressions, all of those sorts of things that Taylor says are necessary in order for a society to exist. Taylor explains the necessity of social imaginary. And by the way, not all societies share the same social imaginaries. Not all societies have the same ideas, beliefs, and practices, values, orientations, attitudes, impressions, concepts, and so forth. To give you an idea, just imagine that you you check into uh, the flight attendant, eventually you board the plane and you find yourself seated next to somebody from North Korea who has experienced zero Western influences. And even if you spoke the same language, you would quickly discover a massive disconnect. The lack of shared social imaginaries. What does this have to do with Romans chapter 4? Let me suggest to you that when Paul traveled and preached the gospel in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, in Syria, Turkey, Greece, Malta, Crete, and so forth, that the gospel he preached included many truths, truths that frankly weren't on the radar of most of his audience. They were not part of that culture's social imaginary. These truth claims that are contained in the gospel were contrary, in fact, not just part of, but contrary to all those ancient Near Eastern orientations and assumptions and concepts, practices of his day. And that is why the gospel that Paul preached inevitably met profound resistance. And one of the primary gospel truths that wasn't on anybody's social imaginary was the doctrine of justification by faith. 
whatever religions, whatever philosophies, whatever belief systems he encountered, no one, no one shared even in a remote, in a modicum, that faith alone had something to do with eternal consequences. That what we believe ultimately matters most. Nowhere. So far in the gospel contained in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul has said, for instance, Romans 1.17, for, in for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith that is, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Paul's pointing to faith. Romans 3, 2, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Or Romans 3, 26, 27, or as a demonstration, I say, Paul writes, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Or Romans 3, 30, since indeed God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one God. To say it another way, Romans 3.28, Paul said this, For this we maintain, that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. No one believed that what you believed mattered most. As Paul preached the gospel to the Jews, to the Gentiles, to all over the ancient Near Eastern world, the truth claimed that he continued to uphold, again, Romans 3, 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the law. Lego Gidzimai, we maintain this constantly, without compromise, consistently, and again, apart from every social imaginary, that a man can only be justified before God by one thing alone, faith. Faith alone. The reformers, sola fide. And apart from your own righteousness, the law, your works, your deeds, your charity, efforts. And again, nobody believed this. There was no social imaginary that Paul encountered that had any remote idea of being justified before God or whatever gods that society obtained by faith alone. But to say it another way, there was no belief system that didn't depend on human effort and deeds. From the Jews in Jerusalem to the Greeks and their philosophy to Romans and their pagan religions, nobody, and I mean nobody, believed that what you believed mattered most. Justification by faith alone wasn't part of anybody's social imaginary. And again, Paul's gospel centers on the question is how is a sinner justified before God? What does it mean to be justified? It means to be declared legally and forensically innocent by God. God crediting the sinner with a status of innocence that can only be apprehended by faith. As we look at this passage, Paul is defending the doctrine of justification before God by faith alone. And he is saying that the one true God has always and only justifies sinners by faith. And how does Paul defend this truth? He turns to history. He turns to history. Paul turns, for instance, in verse 3, back 2,100 years before his time to Abraham. Look at verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, that's faith, and that faith was credited to him as righteousness. That's a quote from Genesis 15, 6. Paul turns to history. 2,100 years before his time, God credited Abraham with righteousness because Abraham believed God, because of Abraham's faith, history. Paul doesn't stop with Abraham. Next, he turns back 1,000 years earlier to David. Verse 6 and 7, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from the works 
Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and those sins who have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Psalm 32. So whether it's 2,100 years before Paul or 1,000 years before, before Paul, Paul is making the point that God has always and only justified sinners by faith. From Abraham to David to Paul's own time, faith alone has always been the means of God justifying sinners. And there's never been any other means of salvation than faith. Never. Yet, please get this. Because of what Paul has already defended and explained in Romans, because of the universal reign of sin in man, depravity of man, justification before God by faith has and is always resisted, compromised, rejected, always. Justification by faith alone has never been part of any natural man's social imaginary. No religion in the world, no philosophy in the world, no belief system in the world, in the history of the world, there's been no, none of that that has embraced the idea of justification by faith alone. Since Paul is turning to history, the history of this doctrine that man can only be justified with God by faith and the promises of God, I want you to think even in a bigger picture of the history of this. Think about ancient Israel at the time of Jesus. What about ancient Israel at the time of Jesus? Did Israel embrace the idea of justification by faith alone? What's the answer? No. It was on nobody's radar. Just the opposite. Ancient Israel their view was that we were made right with God by the works, by keeping the law, by the things we do, things we don't do. And what's amazing about that is here are the Jews who have lived their life in the Old Testament. And I would suggest to you an Old Testament that constantly declared, demonstrated, and demanded justification by faith alone. If you were, and you can look there, or trust me, if you were to think about Hebrews chapter 11, what are we told in Hebrews chapter 11? We're told that by faith, men of old gained approval. By faith, Abel offered to God a sacrifice better than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. By faith, Noah prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. By faith, Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, Sarah herself received the ability to conceive. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. By faith, Joseph made mention of the exodus to the sons of Israel. By faith, Moses left, not fearing the wrath of the king, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, and passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient. By faith, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, what they do by faith? Conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness. By faith, they attained promises. By faith, they shut the mouths of lions. By faith, they quenched the power of fire. By faith, they escaped the edge of the sword, etc., etc., etc. What is being said in Hebrews chapter letter is this, that the entire Old Testament is about faith. And yet the Jews didn't get it. The Jews had no concept of justification by faith. Even as societies change over the last 4,000 years, being right by God, being right with God by faith alone has never been part of any social imaginary. It's always been a battle. Today, if you do personal evangelism, there's a very good chance that if you talk to somebody about their standing with God, you know what they're going to say to you? I'm okay. Why? Because I have faith? No. Because I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as somebody else. No idea, no concept, not on the radar, the idea that faith can justify a person. 
You see, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is a truth that doesn't come from man. It's a truth that only can come from God. It's a truth that doesn't come from man. In fact, it's alien to man. I think of the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. Listen to me. No one, no one, Jesus encountered during his entire life believed that a sinner could be justified by faith alone. No one. The Pharisees didn't believe it. The Sadducees didn't believe it. Herod didn't believe it. Even the disciples didn't believe it. And I would argue even John the Baptist believed it. Though he preached repentance, baptized for repentance, there is no indication in the gospel record of John the Baptist that justification by faith alone was anywhere a part of his ministry or message. And what's amazing as you study the gospels, when Jesus occasionally encountered faith, what was his response? Ready? He was astonished. Astonished at the way Jesus encountered faith. And not only was Jesus astonished, but even those who came to Jesus with faith, with faith were also astonished. What were they astonished? They were astonished at the way Jesus responded to their faith. Again, no one, no idea that faith was the key that unlocked Jesus meeting their needs. Does that make sense? They came with faith, hoping that something would happen to discover that it was their faith that unlocked their need. So, here we are in the book of Romans this morning, throughout which Paul will declare, defend, demand that the only way a person can be made right with God is by faith. Now, if you're a thinking person, you should be asking a question. If justification by faith alone is and was completely alien to man. Question, how did the apostle Paul discover this doctrine? And I'm really glad you asked the question. (laughs) So mark your way in Romans 4, we'll get back there. This is fascinating. Again, the history of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Look with me, if you would, at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, we'll pick it up at verse 11. Paul writes, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to what? Man. For neither I received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, beginning of verse 13, Paul will explain that he was once just like everyone else. That is, believing that works, self-righteousness was the key. Beginning of verse 13, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it, works. Verse 14, how I was advancing in Judaism beyond all my contemporaries among my countrymen, works. Being more extremely zealous For my ancestral traditions, works, verse 15, but when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, called me through his grace, not works, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to come acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I'm not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia. I was uh, was, uh, unknown by by sight to the churches of Judea who were in Christ, But only they were saying, he who once persecuted us is now preaching, what is it? The faith, which he once tried to destroy. What happened upon Paul's conversion? You'll remember he encountered the glorified risen Christ outside of Damascus. 
He was taken into Damascus where he received his sight back. He received the Holy Spirit. He was baptized. He then left Damascus and went to Arabia. And there in Arabia, he received this gospel, this vision, this revelation from Jesus. And then he returned from Arabia back to Damascus and begins preaching, preaching the gospel he received in Arabia. And eventually, as time goes on, he travels to Jerusalem to meet with Simon Peter. He leaves Jerusalem, having met Peter, returns, preaching the gospel again for the next 14 years. The next 14 years. Paul's point at this, at this point in, in this little journey we're on right now is the gospel of justification by faith alone that I preached did not come from man. I wasn't taught it by a man. I wasn't taught it by the apostles. What I preached to you, justification by faith alone, came directly from Jesus Christ. And why is that? Again, because men, including the apostles that time, didn't believe in justification by faith alone. It wasn't part of their social imaginary. Look at Galatians chapter 2 now. So after meeting with Peter, he returns to preaching. And then verse 1 of chapter 2, then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of the revelation that I went up. And I submitted to them, that's the, the apostles, the gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. What does he mean by that? In vain means that I'm empty-handed. That is, I'm without apostolic consensus. Uh, Paul's concern is that were the other apostles also preaching justification by faith alone? Is this truly a consensus doctrine that's a part of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Was the gospel message that Paul was preaching unified amongst the body of apostles? What's the answer? Do you know? We're in chapter 2, look at verse 11. Paul says, but when Cephas, that Simon Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Why? For prior to coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. That is, that he was no longer under the law. He's under the law of faith now. But when they came, that's the law keepers. When the law keepers came, he began to withdraw from the Gentiles and hold himself aloof. Fearing that the party of the circumcision, again the law keepers, and the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy. With the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. They were turning to law keeping, the whole lot of them. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the gospel, the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, to Simon Peter, to the presence of them all, if you being a Jew live like a Gentile and not like Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Why are you putting the Jewish law on these Gentile believers? And then this sarcasm in verse 15. We are not Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. He's saying, you do realize that we're just as bad as the Gentiles. Everybody say amen. And here it is. Nevertheless, verse 16, don't miss it. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ. Even we... He's talking about Jewish apostles. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no, this is universal, no flesh, no one, nobody will be justified. And all God's people said, yeah. Do you realize the the extent to which God took Paul in order to establish this great foundational truth that he maintains without compromise. And again, what we just looked at, <coughs> excuse me, isn't primarily the story of Paul, it is the story of God's involvement in the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Let me put it this way to you. The history of justification by faith alone, number one, <coughs> 
was taught by God to Abraham, was taught by God to David, and taught throughout the entire Old Testament, yet rejected by Israel. Two, justification by faith alone was taught by Jesus, demonstrated by Jesus, yet rejected by the disciples. Three, justification alone uh, was taught by Jesus to Paul, was taught by Paul to the church, and yet often rejected by the church. Think about 2,000 years of church history, even though Paul articulated, even though it was revealed to him by Jesus, even though it's recorded throughout his, his epistles, justification by faith alone, this fundamental gospel truth, for centuries has been rejected by the church, and is even rejected right now as we speak. 1,600 plus or minus years after Paul wrote the book of Romans, it took a movement of God to, re, to reestablish this truth in what we call the 16th or 15th century Reformation to recover the gospel. Sola Scriptura, authority of Scripture, sola fide, justification by faith alone. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, was what was called the formal cause of the Reformation. And faith alone was the material cause of the Reformation. It took a movement of God, a, a marvelous movement of God for the church to regain this key ordinal doctrine of the gospel that we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith alone in Christ. Listen, please get this. As a church, Grace Church, Lord willing, we will be studying through the book of Romans for the next year. Please get this. And maybe it'll keep you coming on Sundays. I believe with conviction that the revelation that Jesus gave Paul in Arabia is absolutely the content of the book of Romans. I believe that being reformed is really embracing what Jesus revealed to Paul in Arabia. Embracing with conviction what Paul articulates in the book before us. And get this, even though the doctrine of justification by faith alone was rediscovered in the Reformation, today, this very day, it is still rejected by many professing Christians throughout the world. Again, let me go through this. Justification by faith alone, taught by God to Abraham, taught by God to David, rejected by Israel. Justification by faith alone, taught by Jesus' disciples, yet rejected by disciples. Justification by faith alone, taught by Jesus to Paul, taught by Paul to the church, rejected by the church. Justification by faith alone, rediscovered in the 16th century Reformation, yet largely again, unfortunately, rejected by the modern church. And that is why every generation needs to be in Reformation. Reformation hasn't ended, the Reformation continues. And I can honestly say this as a Christian and as a pastor for decades now, that I have encountered friends, church members, countless professing Christians who frankly refuse to embrace what Paul says in the book of Romans. Refuse. What Paul says about the true people of God, what Paul says about justification by faith alone, what Paul says about God's election and predestination, what Paul says about the universal reign of sin, what Paul says about the wrath of God, all those things. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I, uh -uh. I don't believe that. Again, every generation needs to be in a process of reformation. How important is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. How important? Am I just up here beating air? Luther said it is that article, that article upon which either the church stands or falls. Calvin said it is the hinge upon which everything hangs. G.I. Packer said it is like Atlas holding the world on his shoulder. If he drops the doctrine of justification by faith alone, it's ruined. Listen, in the whole of Scripture, in the whole of Scripture, there are only two great 
God-man encounters. And they are these. First, Moses and God on Mount Sinai. Guess where? Arabia. The second is Paul and the risen Jesus. Guess where? Arabia. Moses became the voice of the old covenant, and Paul becomes the voice of the new covenant. Moses writes the first five uh, five books of the Old Testament. Paul writes 13 epistles in the New Testament. As God in the Old Testament called Moses to Sinai, God in the New Testament calls Paul to Sinai. Moses was called to Sinai to be given the law. Paul was called to Sinai to be given the gospel. The law that Moses was given pointed to the gospel that Paul was given. Man's inability to keep the law pointed to the need of grace, grace in the person and work of Christ, which can only be apprehended by faith alone. I'm praying that this makes sense. You see, what Paul says in the text we read, we're going to turn there a second, in the text we read, Romans 4 was literally a seismic shock to his original Jewish audience and Gentile audience. Verse 5, but to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. The Jews of Paul's day were born under the law, raised under the law, lived bound to the law. They called it the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, the Sinaiic law, the Torah, which literally means the guide. The Jews in Jesus' day believed in the law and law keeping. The rabbis, in fact, taught that there were 613 Old Testament laws. 613 laws. 365 of them were negative commands. That is, 365 laws of things you shouldn't do, which they said the rabbis did, 365 negative commands that corresponded to the number of days in a solar year. Where they got that, I have no idea. And they said there were 248 positive laws, which they said corresponded to the number of bones and major organs in the human body. And these 613 laws fell into three general categories. One, they call them laws that are self-evident, like thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not bear false words. Self-evident laws. The second category of three is what they call testimonies. These were laws that were prescribed about around events, like Sabbath laws, Passover laws, feast laws. And the third were called decrees. These were things that God commanded to which (coughs) the rabbis had no idea why. God commanded, and we don't know why. Things like dietary laws and sacrifice prescription, priestly laws, and so forth. Listen, when I was an air traffic controller, Charles, also an air traffic controller in another life, I don't know about you, but the manual we use, the air traffic control manual that I used in my day was a 7110.65D. Don't remember? Uh, that means... Uh, Because of changes, the 7110.65A became 7110.6.B. Everybody get that the B became the C, the C became the D. And the D was the manual I used in the early 80s. This week, I took the time to look up what manual they're using now. (laughs) Today, the air traffic controller's manual is the 7110.65AA. That means that since I was in air traffic control, they have been through the 71106.5 EFGHIJKLMNOPQRSTUVWXYZ, tell me what you think of me, all that. They've been through the entire alphabet with changes. It used to be about yay big, thick. I bet the thing is like this now. So now having gone through the entire alphabet, they're on the AA, soon to be BB. Why would I say all that? Because this is exactly what happened with the law. 300 and, or excuse me, 613 Jewish uh, 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 laws uh, were subject to centuries and centuries of rabbinic interpretation and addendums. 
Let me take, just, just so you get this gist, let me just take you to one part of the law regarding the Sabbath. Originally, God said, what do you say about Sabbath? Keep it holy, thou shalt not work, it's a day of rest, pretty simple. But the rabbis asked this question, what constitutes work? What constitutes work? Well, then they identified work involved planning, plowing, reaping, gathering, threshing, exacting, winnowing, purifying, grinding, sifting, kneading, amalgamizing, cooking, baking, shearing, scouring, la uh, laundering, combing, dyeing, spinning, making a loop, threading a needle, tying a knot, untying a knot, riding, erase. I could go on. Everybody got the gist? Stop. This was their social imaginary. These things were how a person was made right with God. Okay. So, again, regarding the Sabbath, God says don't work. Rabbis say what constitutes work. One rabbi says, well, some kind of work involves winnowing. Another rabbi says, well, what constitutes winnowing? More laws. More laws. So winnowing is usually the separation from wheat to chaff, you throw the wheat up in the air and the chaff flies off in the wind. Everybody got that picture? But soon, winnowing came to mean separating anything from anything else. Separating drinkable water from undrinkable water. Separating bones from meat. You ever, you ever hear Jewish people eating gefilte fish? Do you know why they eat gefilte fish? Because you can eat the bones because it's a sin to separate meat from bones. Uh, even something like uh, knocking the mud off your boots, sin. I grew up in Miami for a part of my life on the Sabbath in Miami, large Jewish population at the time. On the Sabbath in certain hotels in Miami Beach, they had what they called Sabbath elevators, which meant you didn't have to push the button. It stopped at every floor because you didn't want to separate one floor from another floor. This is not just novel, folks. They believed that these things determined God's blessing or God's cursing. They believed these things determined the length of their lives. Judgment, plagues, famine, national peace, or war. They believed that these things justified them before God. That you could or maybe not be justified by, uh, before God simply by knocking the clay off your boots on the Sabbath. And they profoundly and deeply believe this. <coughs> to which Paul says, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the work of the law. Look at Romans 4, and I'll be done pretty soon, promise. <coughs> sort, of, sort of promise. Verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? That is, what did Abraham discover? What did he learn? What did God teach Abraham that he didn't know before? Verse 2. For if Abraham was justified works, he has something to boast in, but not before God. What Abraham learned was that God is not moved by Abraham's works. Abraham's works were nothing to boast about before God. So many of us, even as Christians, who would sententially say, yeah, I believe in justification by faith in God, really are sitting here in church today thinking, God's really pleased that I came to church today. I'm glad you're here. Again, verse 3 and 4. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not cre uh, credited uh, as, as a favor, but what's due? Abraham learned this principle, that God above all things wants to be believed. Abraham learned that the righteousness that God requires must come from someone other than himself. Abraham learned that the righteousness that God requires must be a credited righteousness. A credited righteousness that is a gift from God, we call that grace. 
<clears throat> Amazingly, in that Jewish world, they didn't think of Abraham, the Jews didn't, as a model of faith. They thought of Abraham as a model of self-righteousness. One Jewish work called the Book of Jubilee says this, Abraham was perfect in all his deeds, and the Lord was just well pleased with his righteousness all the days of his life. Another work says, Abraham never sinned against God. Really? How about read the book of Genesis? <clears throat> Not the father of faith, but the father of works. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul turns to scripture, verse three. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. By the way, as you look at that, it's a quote from Genesis 15, six. Keep this in your mind. This is the first time in scripture, Genesis 15, six, that the word believe appears. And it is the first time, Genesis 15, six, that we find the doctrine of justification by faith alone. By the way, this verse does not tell us that Abraham believed God because he was righteous. It doesn't tell us that Abraham's faith made him righteous. It does not tell us that Abraham's faith is equivalent to righteousness. What it does tell us is that when Abraham believed God, God credited him with a righteousness that was not his own. The Gizomai, to impute, to attribute, to ascribe righteousness, alien to Abraham, foreign to Abraham, another one's, another's righteousness. The same thing for David. Verse seven and eight, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. This is the gospel, the gospel. The gospel tells us by faith in Christ, God credits me with the righteousness of Christ. And that as Jesus hung on that cross, God credits him with my sin. It's what we call double imputation. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived my life so that he could treat me as if I had lived his life. The righteousness of Christ credited to me, my sin credited to Christ. That's the gospel. Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. John 3, 16, the corner of every, every NFL game, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. What is belief? What is faith? What is saving faith? The reformer said there's three parts to it. The first they called notitia. Notitia is the content of faith. You understand that the gospel has content. It says something. It makes truth claims. The gospel includes, you're a sinner, God's righteous, Christ is God in flesh, died on a cross, bearing sin. Those are truth claims. That's where it begins with notitia. What are the claims of the gospel? The second thing the reformer said next was what they called a census, that is assenting that those truth claims are in fact true. You can say, well, the Bible claims that Jesus was the son of God, but you can say, I don't believe it. At that point, your faith fails. You know the claim, but you don't believe the claim is true. So first, again, notitia, knowing the claims of the gospel, two, a census, believing the claims of the gospel are true, and then third and finally, what they called fiducia, which is personal trust in that. Believing it for yourself, confidence in it, believing yourself. So one, notitia, knowing what the gospel claims, two, believing the, what the gospel claims is true, and, and then three, personally trusting the gospel for yourself. I use a dumb illustration. Somebody says, there's a chair, and you say, okay, uh, Notitia, I know what a, a chair is. And you look at the chair, a sense, you say, I believe that's a chair, I really do, that's a chair. But Fiducia, you go and sit on that chair. 
you make it your chair. That's the gospel. What can I say? I pray be to God that you have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Noticia, Asensu, Fiducia, that you have thrown the weight of your soul and your eternity upon the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing full well that by the works of the law you could never gain God's favor. It is associating yourself with the perfect work of Christ by faith alone. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, again, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Father, every one of us have one shared common need this morning. Every one of us. And that is we need to believe you even more. Help there our faith. Help our faith. Faith is that which connects us with Christ, pleases you, denies ourself, and is the means of grace that we grow in and through. We need to believe you more. Father, we also would pray for the person who is here just listening, curious, whatever. Lord, I pray that your, your word would open their eyes, their heart, to fully, totally, completely believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation as he's offered in the gospel. Father, thank you that it's not according to our works, truly. Thank you that our works, according to your word, are as filthy rags to you. Thank you that we are not like ancient Israel. We're worried about what we do today. Was it enough or too much? Did we knock mud off our shoes because our soul is at stake? All those sorts of things. And Lord, if we as Christians have those concepts and beliefs in our life and our mind and our heart, Lord, purge it. Purge it from us. Remove it. That it might be Christ and his sufficiency and our faith in that sufficiency alone. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me as we stand together for the benediction? My brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.